out onto the corridor. Mm. So I scurried out after them to console them, as yeah. I thought, mm. and they were in a huddle with their shoulders going, I said, God, the boys are really upset. Mm. And I got in and they were laughing. <laughs> and they sort of put their arm around me to console me <laughs> and said, Father, we're delighted that he wasn't beat into a holy death. <laughs> And it was terrific, you know, because, I mean, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross says that people should die in character. That that's what dying with dignity means. And they said, our father was that way all his life. He never meant any harm with it. His neighbours knew him. Yeah. That was the style of him. Yeah. So he died as himself. He just cursed. Oh, he just cursed his way out. And it was a terrific way to go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. yeah. and, and then tell them about the old lady who wanted to see. Oh, the old lady was fantastic because w when I arrived in the hospice, I, I, I was 24 years old going on 17. <laughs> yes. uh, I had never actually seen anybody die. Now, we had ferocious death in our family. Lost three mothers by the time I was 10. Mother, grandmother, granddad, see, yeah. grant. But very protected, of course, from all that. So I arrived up with the collar and everything else, and I was God's rep, the local TD, and I would pull a stroke and see them all out. I hadn't a clue. So I went and bought a book, and I ate the book. This was the definitive book on death and dying. So they said, go up and see Sadie. So, of course, all the way up the stairs, I was saying, if she says A, I'll say B, if she says, and so on. And when I got to her room, she looked at me, and she said, will you do something for me, darling? I said, anything. She said, will you sing? How old was this woman now, Rock? Oh, she was in her 80s. In her 80s, I see. No, the trouble with singing was yes. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross had never covered that in the book. <laughs> <laughs> but even worse, gay, any time I sang at home, my father would say, stand at the door so the neighbours will see we're not baiting you. <laughs> <laughs> so all I could think of, do you know the old songs that we all learned at family yeah. parties? You know, you'd be giggling at your aunts and uncles singing, yes. that sweet mystery of life. <laughs> so I started that and she joined in and she was worse than me and the paint just blistered on the wall. <laughs> For three months, she never let me be on the song. Theology, mm. philosophy, she could sidestep them like anything. Yeah. It was always a song. Yeah. And at the end of three months, I got used to it. I forgot that I was supposed to drag her by the hair <laughs> of the head into acceptance. <laughs> and at the end of three months, somebody said to me, she won't do at all, she's not well. So I went up the stairs now, resolute, to hell with the song, we're dying tonight. <laughs> and I went in and she said, song, and off we went and song again. And at the end of the song, I said, Janie, look at the time, Sadie love, I'll see you in the morning. And she said, indeed you won't, darling, goodbye and thank you. Mm -hmm. And she was dead in the bed in the morning. Good Lord. And it was the most, no, God, no for her, but it was the most extraordinary experience Good for me. Man. Because it taught me very simply, I was there for them, not them for me. Because Good the danger man. for the caregivers is that mm -hmm. we bring all of our agenda in. Do you know, this is how you're supposed to die. And we're going to drag you through it whether you want it or not. Mm -hmm. And like most people's yeah. ideas, Hollywood, that you have an orchestra behind the bed and meaningful things are said. Swoon, and you swoon. <laughs> yeah, you that you swoon and yeah. say meaningful things. And in fact, people die in ordinary ways. People die pretty much as they've lived. And it's to be comfortable enough to do nothing and to be there with them and keep them company. Yes, there is a huge difference, of course, between Padraigine's 95-year-old who's had a damn good life in the long innings, as they say, although, yeah. uh, as, as people regularly say, oh, I, I wouldn't like to live to be 95, and you yeah. say, well, wait till you're 94 and do a wee <laughs> check on that. <laughs> um, but it's very different with a yeah. child or a young person. Oh, yeah. Like I, mean, yeah. I, I can think of a young woman, Norma, um, and Norma would move out of the ward because the others were older, and in a sense, they were reminding her of the fact that her death was coming too. And then the blinds would go and she'd hear the whispers. Mm. And she went out into the corridor for political asylum. And she would sit in a wheelchair out there, quite a young woman with two young children. And the only other place you could sit was beside her in a wheelchair. So here's the two of us sitting in wheelchairs, a real Irish conversation, looking into the middle distance. And she said to me, um, I don't know, she said, do you ever get depressed? I said, sometimes. And she was gradually easing into talking about her dying. And there was a silence. And then she said, Jesus, we're not dead yet. Come on, I'll give you a race. <laughs> And we pulled the two wheelchairs out into the middle of the corridor. <laughs> and when we got to the nurse's station, we fell up against the window. And of course, when she looked out the window, it was the mortuary. And she said, I suppose it's out there for me, in the middle of all the laughing. And I said, well, how do you feel? And we talked about the kids, and we talked about her husband. Then from there on, she never actually mentioned it. I just got to break the host into smaller and smaller pieces every morning so that she could get Holy Communion. And then at the last day, she just caught me by the hand and she said, Christy, am I dying? I said, you are? Am I dying? Am I dying? Now, she was on the point of death. Yes, yes, yes. I said, you are. I couldn't tell her a lie up to the ball yes. of her eye. Yes. I said, Mick is here and I'll stay for a while. And she said, fine. And she lay back and closed her eyes. Hmm. John, you have the secret of life. 
Yvonne told me. <laughs> you should never open your mouth to a researcher. That's right. Of. That's what um, she said. Yeah, I, I claim to uh, have the secret to life. Uh, it comes out of working uh, with death for uh, about the last 20 years on and off. Um, I think the secret to life is to have fun. Have fun? Yeah. Yeah. I remember getting suicidally depressed. And uh, I then asked myself, well, why haven't I killed myself? And it took me three months to answer. And the answer came from Paddy Cavanaugh, the poet. Mm -hmm in a poem called uh, The Christmas Childhood. And he says, or any common sight, like the tracks of cattle, or the corner of a field, and what have you. And the penny dropped. A corner of a field is terribly mundane until you can't see it. And then it's stunningly beautiful. And the penny of that dropping is that you've got to cherish the things while they're actually happening. You get one lash. Live for today. Hmm. Live Very much. For this moment. Very much. And by fun, I don't mean like fun in terms of distraction. I mean fun in terms of relishing now. Yeah. Now, I remember um, being about maybe 17 or 18, and I was in um, the Rainbow Restaurant in O'Connell Street. It's long gone. And I watched a woman drinking a cup of tea and having a bun. And I would consider it probably one of the most spiritual things I've ever watched. The sheer relish of the most common mundane thing. And the fact that she, I don't know, there was just something about the way she enjoyed it. Mm. And, um, and what you mean is that we all worry about what happened yesterday <coughs> and we're all worried about what's going to happen tomorrow and we forget about... Oh, well, that's fair enough too, because it's human yes. nature. But uh, I, I can't help feeling... Uh, that uh, an awful lot seems to pass by. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a bugger to go for a walk with because I'll never go quickly. Mm. I'll never burn calories. I'm too busy just watching them. Mm. I used to love when I lived in Galway walking down the bog for the sheer light of it or the colour of it or the, the birds or the smell of the bog or whatever. That was quite a... Other Which people would probably think I would have well, shaken That's what man. the man said, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And, uh, it, took, it took me years to find out what that meant. But I, ha never I have found the fun, though, actually having the a good fun, laugh. Having a good laugh. Yeah, yeah. is yeah. very yeah. important. Like, when Dad yeah. was dying, mm. uh, you, you were at like, ready death. It's funny. We were all in the room. And, like, there's a kind of cycle you go through. Like, you, you're doing the rosary one minute, then you're having a cup of tea, and then there's silence, you know. <laughs> uh, and my brother farted. <laughs> and he turned around and said, ah, Dad. And that is in a coma, like a core he didn't know anything like <laughs> And we all burst out laughing. And it just broke the spell. Yeah. There was nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> this was a human thing. But when we were laughing at him having done what he did, the priest sticks his head in the door. Oh, it's lovely to see a family <laughs> coping with the group. <laughs> and we were gone. We were, that was it. You know? And I just thought, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. afterwards, yeah. like when Dad was buried in the Hulting mm. with Homer, my brother and Daddy, uh, said that he had been so afraid, uh, he hates hospitals and all that, and he'd been so afraid of Dad dying, and it actually turned out to be one of the best things in his okay. life. And in a sense, that's what I kind of meant when I said a moment ago, your moment will come. It's actually a moment that in, not all deaths, I'd have to say not all, but a lot, mm. do, particularly the first major one, or the first significant one, you can't be the same again. Mm. And that's what mm. I, I mean by that. Mm. It's not actually... Father again, why do we pick tonight to remember the dead? Well, tonight, I mean, it's Halloween, it's, it's yeah. such a great night to be here, to be talking about this at all on this night, and um, thanks very much, Gay. Um, well, the whole thing, you know, Halloween is, is in the Celtic calendar. It's one of the quarter days in the Celtic calendar. We did some of them on the radio, St. Bridget's Day, May Day, Lunas, mm. and Halloween then. And the Celtic year was built around the agricultural cycle. So the turning point in the year, the main turning point, sometimes Halloween is called the Celtic New Year because it's the ending of the agricultural year. By this day, all the farmers around the country are supposed to have their harvest in, their potatoes in, the thatches on the roof, the, the, the turf is brought in. Everything is supposed to be done. That's the real guilty farmers looking in at me now. But traditionally, everything was done mm. by this day. And you had this ending, if you like, of the whole of the year. And this is like, it's, it's nature dying. And the great archetype of the nature dying, of course, this great is, is, is the old Kalyak, the hag, or the witch. She represents, if you like, the ancientness of the earth at this moment, the dying earth. So then you have, you see, with that, the whole association of the other world. At 12 o'clock, I think we have about an hour and a half to go, the mounds all around the country, the megalithic mounds and all the old mounds are supposed to open up and the other world is released. 
Now you were talking about like sort of the sacredness of everyday life there and what yeah, you were saying. Absolutely. This thing in our tradition that the other world is not is not sort of way off up there. It's not a matter of us here living and the dead are off up there. They're just as a veil. They're, they're just there and they're with us and they're in a helpful way with us and or we also can be helpful to them. We're, we're called to pray for the souls of the dead but there's an interaction between us. And on tonight of course the tradition was that people at Halloween left out uh, they, 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 it's interesting about Halloween people never bank down the fire on a Halloween night, they left the fire up to, to, to burn up high build up the fire tonight to welcome in leave the door in the lodge and welcome in the ancestors Put, and they used to set the, um, the, the uh, chairs around the fire and, do, and put the ashes then around the hearth and come down the following morning, leave out fresh water, leave out the boring brack or whatever and then come down the next morning look in the ashes to see if the, uh, if, like, the uh, ancestors have been there and it was considered like a great you know it was something that you, you did because in some way with the death of nature we're, we're called into looking at our own uh, yeah. like yeah. finiteness in some way and that the, the veil is and particularly at Halloween is thinner mm -hmm. not just with the dead though we also have the fairies active tonight see the other world in the Irish tradition and I love this bit like it includes Jesus Mary which are always with us in all our prayers it includes also like the fairies the fairy world that there's these other world beings like ourselves mm -hmm. the fairies now in the Irish tradition are not you know, they're not the little nice little things you see painted in books. The fairies in the art tradition are, as many of you probably know, a whole race of people that are living beside ourselves. They look like ourselves, they're smaller, they're green, but tonight they're supposed to be going from fort to fort. They move from their summertime lists or wrath or fort and they go back to their wintertime one, you see? Uh, like bringing down the cattle from the bowley into your farmyard t t t t by this day. So tonight you could see a chattering procession, as they say. You know, they travel in groups. The fairies. Yes, and, and, and is see, there a full moon tonight? No, there's a new moon tonight. There's a new this moon. This is tonight. very interesting yes. because yes. you see that doesn't often all, happen, does it? No, you see, our ancestors probably wouldn't have, you know, looked up the calendar like we do and go the 31st of October. <laughs> oh, it's Halloween mm. business. They would have been tuned into the actual constellations. See, yes. And the new moon is significant in mm. our tradition because the waxing moon. Whatever you plant, you wouldn't plant at this time of the year, but it will grow. Mm. Or the way the weather is traditionally in weather law, if the weather is, go is, is good tonight, it'll be so, they say, for two weeks uh, till the full moon, and then it'll change at the full moon and go in a different direction. So you can all have a look out, and if I'm wrong, you can all <laughs> bring up again. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, so, you know, so, so is death the end, then? What, 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 what do you believe is going our, to happen? Our, our to nature you? tells us it's not gay. But, uh, let, let me tell you yeah. that Father John O'Donoghue, it, it, yeah. it, it, he was talking about the same sort yeah. of thing. And he said, he told the story of a, a priest and a fellow walking together. And the fellow asked the priest, because the priest knows everything, you see. Uh, they always know everything. And he said, What happens to the soul after you die? Uh, where does it go? And the priest said, It goes no place. And allegorically, I presume speaking, the priest pulled aside the veil. And there were all these souls all around us. That's what he meant by they go no place. They're still with mm. us. They're still here. And that brought you back then to the, the theology of, which is rarely mentioned nowadays, the communion of saints. Yeah. That yeah. they are there for helping and, and watching and, and, and all of that. Yeah. I wonder is that just a comfort and, and a myth? Or, well, it is a comfort and, and uh, it's certainly a comfort for people who are afraid of death and so on and losing their loved ones. But, but do, you, do you reckon there's something in that, Christy? Yeah, I, I do. I do. Yes. Uh, I would be very conscious of the fact that my father, my mother, my grandparents are very much part of the umbilical cord, yes. if you like, that yes. I come from. Uh, I believe when the scripture says that life is changed, not ended, in death. And so our relationship goes on to a different level, simply. And certainly when I was writing the book, I got a palpable presence, a sense of people present in the room with me. Almost as if they were nudging me on the shoulder sometimes, saying, You had the ring taken, Christy, had you? Indeed, not? I hadn't given because I never touch it. You never touch <laughs> it. Never touch it. I see. I'm yeah. a cold water badge. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> but I had that sense of them yeah. being there because things came to mind just yeah. that I had, in a sense, totally forgotten. Mm. So I got a little nudge every now and again. But yeah. I, am, I, I feel very consoled by that. Yes, yes. And you, John? Yeah. Uh, I don't think it matters what we think because we're, we're bound by time and space and mortality. And to actually comprehend life beyond this means comprehending the suspension of time and space. Now, ask people to describe eternity, and they can't. It's beyond our human experience. Quite, quite. So, on the other hand, though, uh, there was a guy, Schleiermacher. I love being able to say that name. <laughs> it took me ages to learn it. Uh, he said... What was it again? Schleiermacher. Schleiermacher. Friedrich Schleiermacher. Yes. yes. Uh, 17th century, the founder of Protestant, liberal Protestantism. He said, we need to believe. 
We need to believe. To believe. And I like that. That's the combination of psychology and theology. Why are you shaking your head, Padre Gein? Are you going to say something right. heretical now? To I don't think we need to believe. I think that it's a totally, it's very natural to believe in a way because if you take the whole of nature, it doesn't end. The winter is not the end of the seasons. Everything around us tells us that, that life continues in some form. It's just that it's the next step, as I said, and we don't know. And I mean, I stand there and I think to myself, here's the little earth here, and we're all running around it and trying to work things out, and we haven't even got it right yet. And then you look out and you see all the planets, and you go on, and there's universes, infinite. We don't know half it of what we see. Think of the interior journey, the worlds that are within each of us, the mystery, the deep mystery in each person here. Our souls, like, we're, we know that we're not just body. We know that we're, we've spirit well, and soul, embodied spirits. And that, that are, you know, that, that there's... A, and, and, I mean, you can't just deny, I'm like, all denying. the wisdom traditions. I mean, I mean, all the wisdom traditions, like, that say that there is, that we're more than just our body, than this earthly time. But you're you looking know? for a spiritual solution to a psychological problem. And <laughs> the psychological problem is the awareness that death is the end. Carl Rather, the theologian, said, how come we know that we're more than the sum of all the theologies, if you like? We have an intuitive feel for the next life. And that's but okay. We, that, we don't proof. have to work at all. But why do we have to have proof? Because it's like we, we have live to prove on proof. We live in a concrete world. We don't. Uh, well, I don't have to. I mean, there's proof enough in intuition. You know, well, there's proof and, enough and, in and the interior. And I suppose faith has, has little to that's do with it, or, or exactly, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, where's, where's uh, I beg your pardon, where's um, uh, uh, Eddie O'Neill? Eddie, I beg you. Hello, Eddie. Now, I, I was uh, on the on the radio program during the week. I asked for people who had a, sort of a, an out of life or a near death experience and so on. Yes. Eddie, tell me tell me your story because I'm not familiar with it. I just knew you were here in the audience. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, Guy, when I was five years of age, I was involved in a uh, very serious accident. Uh, I was brought to the hospital down in the old in the old Jervis Street. What, what uh, was the accident? It was the uh, bombings in uh, Dublin in uh, 1974. In Talbot Street? No, in uh, Parnell Street. On oh, Parnell Street. You were yeah. there? I was indeed. At five. Yes. Who with? Uh, with my father and my uh, old brother Billy. Yeah. And uh, as I say, I was uh, brought, brought to the hospital. I was one of the first there, thanks to the very skillful driving of a uh, passing motorist. But um, when I got there, or I uh, remember being, being brought into the uh, operating theatre on a stretcher. Suddenly, I found myself uh, standing in the car park of the hospital, and uh, opposite where the uh, old casualty department used to be, there was a building which I believe to be the old chapel. And on that wall there, there was a there was a line of coffins, and as each person was dying, uh, the uh, the porters were coming in, or oh, sorry, coming out, and. Uh, with a stretcher and putting a coffin on the stretchers so they could accommodate the bodies. Then it felt like uh, I had been spun around uh, several times. And I found myself uh, facing a circular tunnel with a brilliant, brilliant white light about it. Now, I can't say that I was walking. Uh, if it, it, it felt like, if I could give you the example, I've been on a uh, conveyor belt. And I got to the end of the uh, tunnel and I met an old man there, and he, he just turned around and said to me, he said, it's not your time. He said, you have to go back. You have to go back. And then uh, I woke up back then in the uh, hospital. And who was the old man? Did I, you know him? He, he, was, he was very much like an old, uh, it was very much like an old photograph of, uh, of my grandfather. Like the old photograph of your grandfather? Yes. Thought with a sort of bowler hat kind of type of thing, yes. Type of thing, yeah. Yes. And he said, it's not your time yet, go he back. He said, it's not your time. He said, yeah, you have to go back. So you came back? So I came back. I'm sitting here. I see. And what about your mother and brother? Well, my, uh, my uh, brother um, was, was very badly injured along with myself. And it, it took um, an awful lot of work by, uh, by an awful lot of very, very skillful surgeons to, uh, to, br to bring us back yes. to what you see here. But uh, my uh, mother is uh, she. She was she was absolutely devastated yeah. by it as well. But 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 thankfully now yeah. she's uh, getting on. With and and do you think you died? Oh, I know I did. You know you died. I know I did, because it wasn't until years later when I, when I actually read uh, some similar stories about it. Like I, if now I have I I personally have absolutely no fear of death. I enjoy life to yes. the absolute fullest. As that man said yes. there, I do what I want, when I want. Yes. 
Um, you went down this tunnel and you were going towards a bright light, a, a brilliant, yes, brilliant white light. A brilliant yeah. white light. That's, a, that's a, a regular description of what it is. Were you going to say something to me? Hiya, yeah. yeah. Hello. Yes. Because I had a similar experience. Um, it was an injection I got. Can I get up to you? Sorry, that I, I don't I don't like the sound of that microphone. Sorry. You you got an injection. Sorry there for disturbing you. Yeah. I got an injection for a bad yes. headache. Yes. And within Sorry. five minutes I knew something was happening. I wasn't sure what. Reaction. Reaction. Um, I tried to say a prayer, but I started at the bottom, came to the middle, couldn't say it. And then I went through the tunnel. Which in my case was like my radiator in my bedroom. I was going and going and pulling myself back. But um, somehow or another, after a while, it was easier to let go. I really didn't want to be back. I wanted to go. And I had a young daughter. She was about four or five at the time. And like the young man had said, um, I came out into the light and I saw a man. I a man? A man. Yeah, all dressed in white. Now, I feel it was, might have been my father who died many, many moons ago. And he said this very same thing to me. It's not time. You're not needed here yet. And I kept on pulling myself back and pushing myself forward and doing all sorts of things. And, you know, I, I came back. My next door neighbor got the doctor back again and he stayed with me for four or five hours in my bedroom. Like it was nine o'clock that night when I woke up. And, um, you know, I'm not afraid to die. I would never, ever be afraid to die there. And, uh, so you were nearly gone and you came back? Yes. Yeah, now, what, what's interesting, hold on for a minute, uh, th uh, thank you for joining in, sorry for disturbing you. What, what's interesting about that, um, Christy and John and, and Padre Gein, is that sort of some kind of wish fulfilment? <laughs> <laughs> oh, is, that, is, is, is that the mind confirming what we've been taught and what we think and so on, that you go towards a bright light and it's all shiny, it's going to be wonderful? And, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I don't think matter. so, because uh, 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 what I, I do, if you like, in a clinical setting, is I accept that. I don't have, if you like, some intellectual power to dismiss it. Okay, I can explain what these people are talking about, maybe neurologically, as it, it involves light and it involves sound. And uh, as Porvi said earlier, like those of the senses that deteriorate nearly last. But uh, it, it doesn't matter how I explain it, because in the clinical sense, you accept the experience uh, at a human level. The, the only thing that matters is, uh, does it bother them? Now, if it bothers them, then I have a job. Mm. If it doesn't, then I don't. But it doesn't bother them, clearly. It's just removed from them, according to the, the woman and, and, and um, uh, Eddie O'Neill. But it, 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 it's it, not proof, Gay. No, no but it's thing, removed you know? the fear of death, so it doesn't bother for them. But for, for, them. The, for the listeners, it doesn't yeah. be, as there's still a leap of faith. Yeah. Yes. For each of them, at an individual level. Yes. Uh, and that's my only... I've read uh, lots of literature on yeah. this topic. It still requires you making a leap forward for yourself. Yes. Yeah. Sure, it sounds Sorry, easier right. than yeah. being born, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. You know? Know? It, it, it can disappoint some people, Gay. It can disappoint yes. some what? That, that near death? Coming back. Coming back. Yes, mm. because they were ready to die. I mean, I've had patients who were ready to die and had all their things sorted and so on and yes. couldn't. Mm -hmm. And couldn't. And literally were there and there and there. I would almost ask every day, what do I do now? I'm ready to die. I'm almost guilty that I'm still around. I'm sorry, lads, I'd love to go, but, yeah. you know, yeah. the, the train isn't leaving yeah, the station. Again. Yeah. I believe firmly that it takes a certain energy to die. I would have experienced that with the people I, I've been with, that one gets to a weak state and that you do need actually the prayer energy of other people and actually almost the physical energy sometimes, just like a child coming out of a mother's womb, that there's an energy involved in that mm. and the mother needs help. She, you know, there's a mm. whole energy in that experience. Mm. And if you go to the other end of your life cycle, there is, I would say, an energy yeah, needed, you know? Yeah. John, yeah. what is this dead party you run every so often? <laughs> Never open your mouth to a researcher. Um, I do a, a dinner on the 6th of January every year, and it's called the Dead Dinner. The Dead Dinner? Dinner. I've and been it, to a lot of them. It's, <laughs> it, well, you, you haven't been to one of these. Uh, this is a reenactment of the James Joyce short the story, dead. The yes. Dead. Mm. And it's actually, people think it's morbid, but it's not. I, if you've read the story, it's an exquisite love story of the most classic kind, right? But it's, it's, it shows Joyce's notion that we're constituted by the dead, right? We're all here because people who had us have gone before. 
but it's also a celebration of life. And each year, uh, it's nine courses. Uh, now, it's meant to be 16 people, but last year it was 33. And I invite six people every year, and everyone else once. And I uh, cook the whole thing myself. Nine courses? Yeah. And uh, three courses are the same every year, and the other six I cook on the night, never having cooked them before. So no one knows it's going to happen, including myself. And, uh, what night is that, did you say? <laughs> <laughs> is that the 6th of January? Yeah, what have to be well that, that is very significant. That's no like Naman, you know, even though like yeah. women's yeah. Christmas, so we can sit back and get served. I'll go next time. <laughs> yeah, you have to be well in. Don't worry, <laughs> though. You're, do, you're doing well. <laughs> and, uh, and do they all do a turn, then? Well, uh, I, we all come in period costume, and I come as Joyce. I have me her hat that I bought in Brown Thomas's for 32 quid years ago, and I have me jacket and the whole bit. And I do a reading from the book from the story, yes. somewhere, you know, yes. and then other people can if they wish. Sing but, a song or... Oh, Jesus, anything, like it's uh, <laughs> open house. Yes. And uh, I uh, try and just, there's often fights over it, as people do be looking for the invite, yes. you know. Now in the year 2000, everyone who's ever been is coming back, right, we're going to have to see you in the, and, the new And millennium. does this number dwindle every year as people die? Uh, no. No, mind Not you, so a few of them have who have been at the dinner didn't <laughs> think they'd ever make it. <laughs> <laughs> and one fella uh, left the house at half six and got yeah. home at half two and was half an hour away from his house and he doesn't know why it took him so long. He does have a vague memory of <laughs> green vomit. That's all he told me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be crude. Thoughts, but I won't be yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't oh, my dear, food that gave that, I can assure you. Christy, but, uh, tell us a, a, a funny bit about death. Go on, cheer us up. <laughs> well, uh, humour is an interesting thing, yes. Gay. I think a lot of people expect that a hospice, for instance, is going to be morose, yes. sombre. Yes. You know, you fix your face going in and this is what you expect. Of course, this is what you see then, you know. And I think the way we used humour in our place, I mean, the patients use it, was to transform the reality. There's different kinds of humour. There's where you whistle past the graveyard, which is, I'm afraid of it. Mm -hmm. Or there's the kind of black humour, which is, we make a feck of this and it keeps, us away, it keeps it away from us and it's a kind of an insensitivity thing. But the kind of humour they had was transforming. And I remember one man who had a bent spine. And God love him, he went around like that the whole time, I mean, looking at the floor. And his daughter came in one night and she felt for him. And she said, oh, Daddy, I feel so sorry for you, seeing you like that, going around bent. And he said, I find a lot of money. <laughs> 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 okay, one last thing I want to ask you. Sorry, sorry. Okay, I beg your pardon. I didn't come back to you. What do you want to say to me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just want to, to uh -huh. say I came to Dublin in the sixties and I was staying in Diggs, and I picked up pleurisy at a football match. And one night I was in the Diggs and I was absolutely convinced I wasn't going to see Morning. I was convinced I was goner, but I'd have died happily that night had I known that my mother wouldn't worry when she heard that I was dead and has given me a totally different outlook on life and also on death. Mm. And I think if there's someone looking in tonight who has a problem with someone they have lost or grieving for someone, if they understood how the person that has died felt, it would be easier for them to come to terms with their grief. Good man. Well done. Okay. Uh, how do you want to die, Christy? I would like to die pain-free with my family. Pain-free so that I can focus on them rather than on me. John? That the people I hurt know I'm sorry, that the people I love know I love them, and on an IV drip of vodka. Father <laughs> 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 I, I don't, I'm easy about it any time, any place. You know, they say in Irish, foes and vosh, there's a sod ahead of us all, step that we'll take in our lives, and that's the place of our death. So that could be anywhere, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it could be okay. That's how I feel. Okay. Anyway. I'm glad I talked about this on Halloween. Thank you very much indeed, all Thank three. Thank you very much. Christy is signing a copy of his book. Where is it? Easton's tomorrow, is it, Christy? You're that's signing right, copies yeah. of the book. One o'clock. One o'clock in Easton's O'Connell Street. Very good. Yeah. Thank you all very much. What? What? Just what? Keep going for a minute. Just keep going for a minute. Why? Well, anyway, it's called The New Curate. Uh, how long were you a priest, Christy? Seven years, Gay. You didn't lose your faith, of course. But no, not no, at all. just didn't want to be a priest anymore. That's it. Yes, John, sorry, yes. I think you like this. Uh, yeah. There's a famous story in our field in this topic 
and it's where the kids, uh, the parents come down one morning and they find the goldfish dead. Oh yes, yes. And, uh, the, the this, this, the, sorry, I beg your pardon, what, 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 what do you want to do? Go to the castle. Okay, sorry, I'll come back to you John, just hold on a minute, I haven't read the story. The declaration. Plus 131,835, given a total of 706,259. <laughs> That is 706,259. Os rode gwelin voti Mary McAleese, os con an quota. Dar ve minish gwel Mary McAleese, tuffa mar ochtaran er eren. McAleese has exceeded the quota. <laughs> I hereby declare. I hear. <laughs> I hereby declare Mary McAleese elected to the office of President of Ireland. <laughs> There you go. I wonder, does she know that she got three rounds of applause, three separate rounds of applause here in the studio of The Late Late Show? Um, uh, uh, yes? Just about that. Her um, life will never be the same again. Yeah, well, yeah. Halloween was also the time at the big festival of Tara used to be held, and Tara was the ancient mythical capital of Ireland, and it was the actual capital for a while. And the, the king, the high king of Ireland, was inaugurated during the festival of Samhain, the festival of Halloween. That, that's what Brilliant. seems to come out tonight. of the manuscript. So to, and tonight's tonight. a new moon as well. So, I mean, there is something tonight, big happening. Tonight, and Halloween. Another woman, yeah. Tonight, new moon. Tonight, yeah, new president. The whole Isn't tradition, that yes. Uh, coming Mind together in some, very, in some way, yeah. And how often would that happen, I ask you, through the centuries, through the centuries? John, I interrupted you. You were going to say the first experience that children get of death is right. very often the dead goldfish. Well, the dead goldfish. Yes. And the, the parents uh, come down and they see the goldfish. And like most, they don't want Johnny to be upset by the thing, and they say, oh, just what are we going to do? And they decided that the mother would go up and keep them talking. Yes. And the father would go out and get one. Now, I did this on my own girls, and I had a hell of a job explaining why he was twice the size and had a black spot. <laughs> but, uh, so the dad went off and got the goldfish and put it in. Your man comes down, never bats an eyelid, and they're dead shut, you see. The following morning, they come down, and the new goldfish is dead. <laughs> and they... <laughs> nearly die, so they say we'll try and pull it again, you see, so they do, and they're dead chuffed, like they're really on the bottom, and the young fella's talking to his older brother that night, you yes. see, and he says, Jesus, it's amazing, you know, two nights now I've killed the goldfish, and I wake up in the morning, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
<laughs> well done. That's all. That's all. We'll take a break here. Thank you very much indeed, and well done on a, on a somber note. We'll take a break here. Thank you. Good evening. Yay. Everybody's in great form. We've all got our hampers and we're all ready to go and it's great and it's Halloween. Give me an ooh. Yeah. ooh. Have we got a new president? Give me an ah. Wow. And it's not Eddie Roach. Give me a who's Eddie Roach? Who's Eddie Roach? That's politics. So there you go. And, and, and Dana. Give Dana a round of applause before we go any further. Wasn't she brilliant? Dana. Would you be? And, and I knew Dana was going to win whenever I heard the results coming in from Donegal. Did you hear the results coming in from Donegal? It, it was great. It was, it was McAleese, six points. McAleese, six points. <laughs> and, and, and Dana, douze points. And, and apparently Dana now has inspired loads of musicians and, and singers from around the world to stand now as the head of state. Did you know this? Because apparently tonight on the news, this, was, this is true, it was on the news tonight, that Garth Brooks is now going to stand for the President of America. <laughs> Julio Iglesias going for the King of Spain. <laughs> Elton John's going for the Queen of England. <laughs> right? I don't know whether you know this or not, but Elton's, Elton actually wrote a wee song for Dana to, to commemorate her doing so well. We, can I sing this? Can I do this, Gay? Yeah? Okay, be beautiful, beautiful song. Here we go. De dedicate it to Dana. Here we go. Goodbye, Derry Rose. Although I never voted at all, you had the votes to beat Nally and Roach. Sure, Jesus, they didn't get many at all. Oh, you came back from America and told the press you wanted peace. It was more than John Bruton said about Sinn Fein and Mary McAleese. And it seems to me you ran your campaign all about the church and sin. Never wondering where the altar boys and the priests had been. Um, <laughs> well, that's true. Look, look, at, look at all the young people going, greeting all, all, the, all the grannies, all the Daniel O'Donnell fans go. <laughs> oh, there's no call for that down the late date. Honest to God, was not desperate. He was doing so well, he mentioned the priests. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great though if Daniel, if Daniel had a went for a president? Wouldn't that have been brilliant? Yeah. Eh? Look at all the Daniel fans. Hey! Could you imagine though Bill Clinton would have landed at Shannon, right? And instead of having the, 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 Irish, the Irish band from the army, Daniel would have had about 60 oil dolls from Donegal with tea and biscuits waiting for him, right? <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't have been great. And Bill would have come down the steps and, and they said, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome the President of Ireland, Daniel O'Donnell. And right, here we, we do this, right? Welcome the President of Ireland, Daniel O'Donnell. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it is absolutely fabulous to be president of Ireland and, and I would just like to say, Bill, that there's always a fire in the kitchen. <laughs> there, you know, Wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it be absolutely fantastic if you were present? You're a queer, good-looking fella. Look at this boy here, look at you. Eh? I'm not gay, but you're making it awful hard for me. <laughs> so, I want, I want, what about gay? Didn't he do great with the presidential candidates? Wasn't he super gay? Wasn't he? Remember that, yeah? <laughs> he was great. And I think, I think gay should go on now to chair the Charlie... The, would you do that? The Charlie Hawley Tribunal? Absolutely. Wouldn't, Absolutely. Wouldn't it be great? And, and gay would come on and go, OK then, it's the Charlie Hawley Tribunal. <laughs> Here comes Ben Dunn. Ben, of course, has a brown envelope. It is guaranteed Irish. <laughs> In the envelope, we have 1.3 million pounds, and the good news is there's one for everybody <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> 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 And then he could do the Northern Talks, couldn't he? And to commemorate the Northern Talks, our friends at Waterford Crystal have brought out this lovely crystal armalite and the good news. <laughs> <laughs> You're living dangerous. <laughs> right? Wouldn't it be great? And apparently Charlie Hawley was framed. Give me a woo. <laughs> 
Apparently the guards snuck into Charlie's, Charlie's house and they climbed the wall and they got in and they were rifling through the drawers looking for all the documents and this Rottweiler came round the corner and went because that, that's the way Rottweilers go apparently. And the, <laughs> and the policeman went, don't bark and the dog didn't bark and he said sit and the dog sat. He said give me your paw and the dog went <laughs> What else has been going on? Schumacher lost the Grand Prix. Oh. But Eddie Irvine has signed a new contract with Ferrari. Give Eddie a round of applause. Hey. Eddie Irvine. And Eddie's the only driver in the Grand Prix circuit from Northern Ireland. And you can tell that because he wears a black balaclava underneath the helmet. <laughs> and whenever he goes into the pits, all the other drivers are out checking under the car. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and have much time, don't be clapping, honestly. <laughs> and what else going on? Ireland, Ireland drew in the football. Oh. Wasn't that shocking? Ireland drawing in the football. Oh. And it was a bad match. And I, I find the difference between soccer and Gaelic is when it's a bad match in soccer, it's a bad match, right? But in Gaelic, right, the commentator, even if it's a shite match, the, the commentator can make it sound brilliant, can't they? <laughs> That's true, but it's true, isn't it? Because in soccer, they just go, Quinn, Townsend, Townsend, <laughs> Quinn. Cascarino. And it, it's really boring, right? I went, I went, this, right? I whenever I, I was watching, right? I was actually driving in the car, right? And I was listening to the All Ireland final a couple of years ago, right? And they tell you everything but the bloody score, right? I was driving in the car and Michael and Moriarty was on his phone. You join us here in Palga Crogey. As I say, it's Jimmy Joe Murphy. Jimmy, of course, is a chicken farmer from Kinley. The chicken, the chicken house last night was raided and a number of chickens were stolen. Poor Jimmy has no chickens left. The moment. Just tell me the score. His father before him was a great player. He played in 1947 during the ban for soccer. Just tell me the score. His grandfather before him, he fought in the 1916 Rising. What a rising that was. And his great grandfather before him saddled up King William's horse. Just tell me the score. It was a brown horse and it had a white saddle. What a horse it was. Just tell me the score. There are a number of people watching here today. They're watching it. I must say hello to Padraig O'Hara, who is 94 years of age. He's watching today in Adelaide. Just tell me the score. They're watching in America. They're watching in Africa. They're watching in South Africa. New York, London, Paris, Munich. Everybody's talking about pop music. Just tell me the score. And the score is 2-12 to 4 points. I'm Patrick Kennedy. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> Oh, well done. Great. Well done. Great, great, great. That was Patrick Kilty from up above, and he'll be at, at the Olympia next Thursday. He's here as part of the Murphy's Ungagged Comedy Festival in the Olympia Theatre next Thursday evening. And I, I cannot disclose it to you, but we are expecting some rather good news about Patrick Keelty within the next week or so. But my lips are sealed because when you're told something in con... Oh! Ah, 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 no! Has to do with a new television series and a new opportunity and everything. He's a young man going places and I'm not surprised. Okay, that was Patrick Keelty. We'll take a break here. Come back to the top here. Thank you. Oh. You big Egypt, will you come back for God's sake? I'm talking about you. I didn't divulge your confidence. I didn't divulge your confidence that you told me. I'm supposed to do that, not you. Um, do you want to say what is in store for you, or, uh, or, or, or is it premature? It's a bit a premature. Bit premature. Ah. No, but, but you're hoping for good things in yes, television and show yes, business there generally. There may be yes. an announcement uh, over the in, weekend. Over about, the weekend. About a, a big show. About a big show for you. But a bit, yeah. of, a bit, a bit of a do. A bit of, bit of a do. Well, well that's nice to know. Okay, now, now. Okay, that's all right, you see. Right. Hmm. You are required. We got 200,000 entries for our postal quiz. What was the answer? Dracula was the answer because Halloween and blood sucking and death and all that sort of thing. We're very cheerful people, all the time. And um, you, you, you pick a card or a, a, a coupon or whatever from anywhere you wish. Anywhere, I'll anywhere stay out of the way. Anywhere at all. Dig deep or dig. Take it from the top or take it from the left. Take it from the right. Take it from anywhere you want. Just to. 
Yes, well, there's no need to overdo it, I mean, isn't there? There's no need to make a complete act out of it. And that's a picture postcard. Is the answer right, Dracula? I do believe it is. And is that a telephone number? That would be 4524... Shut! <laughs> you put not, your not foot in it everywhere, it. everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. And you insulted Dana, you insulted our new president, you insulted everybody. And you insulted the holy priests as well. Stay there, don't move. <laughs> I've been asked several times, what is the final story on <laughs> Shew and Maloney and the chair? We have people from Donegal. All the, what do you mean you forgot Shew and Maloney and the chair? Everybody wants to know about Shew and Maloney and the chair. The famous chair, the antiques, all of that. The situation is this, that Shew and Maloney refuses to speak to anybody connected with RTE or The Late Late Show or any of their brethren, kith or kin. We have phoned several times, we tried to contact her, she will not discuss the matter with us. She will only talk to us through her solicitor. The, uh, the, she still insists that she restored the chair. A man called Duffy in Francis Street, who you will remember, said that he restored the chair. He was on the Pat Kenny radio show the week after because it was the last show of the season. He was on the Pat Kenny show with Shoe and Maloney and she called him a liar. And he is suing RTE for her calling him a liar on the Pat Kenny show because he said he restored the chair. She still says there are two chairs. We can't find either chair, we can't trace either chair, we have no <laughs> recollection of it, There's no chair. And, and the difficulty is, we have written to her and said, in view of this controversy, would you not consider giving us back the prize? Now, we're not talking about brain surgery here. We're not talking about nuclear fission or anything. It's just a, a harmless little sort of a, a night on the Late Late Show. And we suggested to Shu and that she might return the prize to us, that we can give it to somebody else. And she has not agreed to that either. So the whole thing is in abeyance. That's the only way I can describe it. It is in abeyance. And we hope to resolve it sometime. But when that would be, I do not know. Thanks for giving away the, the telephone number, number. What? Do you want the number? No, I don't want the number. <laughs> what? <laughs> Now, now, on line one. Hello, line one. Hello, line one. <laughs> Hello, line one. <laughs> Hello, Gay, how are you? How's how are, everybody there? How are you? Well, I'm very, very well indeed. Very well. Where are you as we speak? I'm actually in Dublin Castle, and I'm desperately sorry that we have just literally come off the podium this moment. I know. There were and I would love to have been with you, but it's just not going to be there, possible. There were delays all the way along the line, right and the fog, along. and all sorts of things. Aran Islands. Uh, we understand, Mary, and thank you for taking the call. How are you? I'm extremely well, considering. <laughs> I'm very, very well indeed, Gay. Can sh you see me as we speak? I can, I can, you can see you. We're all watching yes. you. Aren't I lovely? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're, 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 you are. you're worn out. Not really, no. I took your advice. Do you remember the other night when you met me, you told me to go home and go to bed, you said, so I did exactly that. I actually offered to go home with you. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to tell anybody that, but well, I'm, glad you, just, yeah, I'm gl glad you didn't tell the entire nation that day. I, I can brag with the best of them. <laughs> so you went home and had a rest. Were you ill? I had, I had a very bad flu during the week. Yes. I did. I did have a very bad flu. But actually, it's ironic because my husband, who hasn't spoken for the last six weeks, lost his voice, but I didn't. I've done nothing, only speak for the last six weeks, but indeed, the voice held up. Indeed. Mary, your, uh, your life will never be the same again. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> never be the same again. I know, it'll be a great adventure. We described it tonight as a great adventure. And we look forward to the next seven years enormously. Was there any stage during the whole campaign when you regretted getting involved? Not even for a second. Not even through the worst of times no. at all. Uh, I, I never, never felt that at any stage. I'm sure that other people around me did, and I'm sure that friends and family did wonder, but I just had a kind of an inner strength that kept me going, and also an inner conviction that kept me going right the way through it. Hmm. Is Martin going to keep on dentistrying? No, he'll, uh, he'll be finishing up, in fact, this week. I think it will be his last couple of days doing that. Uh, there hasn't been a tooth, I don't think, filled in Cross McGlenn this past month, so I imagine <laughs> there's a queue at the front door. But um, uh, he'll, uh, I think he'll remedy all that this week. Yeah. And, uh, He'll be, he'll be uh, winding down and moving out of the practice yeah. very shortly. Before I forget it, I never asked you, uh, how do you go from accountancy to dentistry? Well, that's something you'd have to take up with Martin. I have to say that at the time that he did that, I thought it was a sign of early male menopause or some of these things. Yeah. But, and I didn't expect it to sustain. I thought that the first time that he saw a set of teeth coming at him that he would turn and run back to accountancy, but it didn't work that way. And how long was he an accountant? Well, I suppose that part of ten years. 
I see. And then he just decided to do dentistry. Just decided. Well, he, to be honest, he had always had it in the back of his mind. He was one of these people who probably took poor career advice going to university and did the wrong subject. And then he was very lucky that he was able to backtrack because at the time that he backtracked, of course, we had no children. Mm. Before he finished, of course, we had three children. So mm. um, I don't know what that says about dentistry as against accountancy. <laughs> Yes, indeed. I'm trying to think of a gag. Patrick Healty probably has a filthy one, but I won't go don't to Don't dare ask him. <laughs> don't dare ask him. Um, uh, uh, Mary, what about the children? You, you protected them during the whole campaign from uh, becoming involved and all of that. that uh, what are you going to do about that now? I think I'd like to continue to do that. I think they're entitled to their private lives. Naturally enough, their lives will be transformed. The mm. first thing that happens is they move school and they move home. And uh, so I think that it's important to them that uh, as great a degree of normality surrounds that as possible. Clearly, I think uh, the president is very much in the public eye. And it's one of the things that I must say that Mary Robinson did particularly well, and indeed Paddy Hillary before her. She did, didn't she? Um, yeah. was the, this, this business of keeping the family uh, well out of the limelight. And I think that's important. I don't think it's fair to children um, to have their lives too intruded upon. Mm. What, 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 what do you do exactly now? What, what is your plan in the immediate future? Inauguration night is when? It's on the 11th, the 11th of oh, November. November, yeah. Um, what, what do you plan to do now? Well, I think there's an amazing round of parties about to break out all around us now. So um, we're heading out to say it's yes. really a, a round of thank you to so yes. many people. And, and, then, and then in the next week or so, what are you doing? Then? In the next week, I'll be making the arrangements for the move. It'll be quite, uh, there'll be quite an amount to be done uh, mm. in terms of making. And also, of course, uh, there'll be a, a resignation letter now to go to the Queen's University of Belfast and a lot of goodbyes and farewells to be said there. Um, also making arrangements for our home in Restrever and um, we, we are probably, I'm not sure if we're the first family to move to the Arras complete with the grandfather who lives with us. Um, Martin, oh, Martin's your grandfather father has lived with us for 15 years. Has he really? He and has. is he moving too? He'll be moving to the Arras, please God. <laughs> oh and I hope I don't ever find him up a tree in the Phoenix Park <laughs> like I found him in Restrever. <laughs> did you... Did did you say as you found him in Ross Trevor? Yes, I came home from work one evening there about three weeks ago and I found him up a tree. He's 81 years of age and he was cutting branches up a tree. God, you had me worried there for a minute, Mary. <laughs> what did you, you think he was doing up a tree? Well, I wondered, I wondered. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for you to tell me indeed. So he 81 and he was up a tree cutting... Yes. Well, there Can are you imagine the damage you might do in the Arras? Absolutely. Well, there are people to do all that sort of thing. Yes. Are, you, are, you, are you fearful at all, Mary? Not even remotely. No. No, no. I'm, you know, I'm very exhilarated by the, by the challenge in front. And one of the great things about, the, about crisscrossing the country over the last six weeks has been just the opportunity to see how much of you know, Irish life, uh, how much goes on at so many different levels, whether it's voluntary, whether it's in business, whether it's in commerce, whether it's people struggling with uh, all sorts of problems uh, and, and struggling with all sorts of successes as well. And to see just the amount of goodwill the, the, the sheer hospitality of the Irish people is it's just overwhelming mm. and the courage of them and mm. the sheer courage uh, so I'm going to take a lot of those memories into Aris with uh, Aris Notron with me and, and work very hard on behalf of those people Yes. Was there any piece of, of critical advice that you got that you can remember that made a difference or made a huge difference or whatever during the campaign? Mostly the best advice that I got was to keep on going and to ignore uh, much of the, if you like, the criticism. And I think that was very good advice, to let that go, not to carry it in my heart and not to carry it inside me um, and, and to let it go. And I think that was, a very, that was probably the best advice I got. Mm. And uh, you must have had very funny moments, the things that people say to you and so on. I know it's unfair to ask you now, can you remember any of it, but I'm sure you got some great crack. Well, I think the funniest moment was when our four, four mobile phones went off the one time in the car and we discovered that actually the person in the front seat was talking to the person in the back seat, but they actually <laughs> thought that they were in different cars. <laughs> that was the funniest moment. <laughs> well done, well done. It's 25 to midnight. Thank you very much in indeed for taking the call. You must be worn out. When, when the result was announced, we were looking at you here and incidentally, this studio audience gave you four separate rounds of applause. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Twi twice yes, thank you so much. Twice as Gaelic and twice as Berla. So, so, so you did. You did very well indeed. <laughs> but, 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 did you, did you well up at all? Did you feel emotional when the 
when the guy really no, said... Uh, no, I mean, I, I tend to be very cool. Um, I'm sure there will probably come a time tomorrow morning when I'll run around doing a Claire Yahoo or something um, uh, mm. something equivalent to it. But I tend to be very, very cool under pressure. And uh, just this evening, I just felt very steady, very calm, uh, which is just as well, because everybody around me was hysterical and somebody has to stay cool. Mm. But no, I felt very calm. Mm. Very, very calm indeed. Well, maybe, please God, you'll join us on a later show. If that I was hope possible. to do that. And can Indeed. I apologise to you again? That's we just right. ran please, so short please. of time. It's a night of night. We just established, in fact, uh, during an earlier discussion that tonight is a very special night in ancient Celtic uh, mythology and so on, because not only is it Halloween, not only is there a new moon, but in Tara on this night they used to inaugurate the great chieftain. And tonight huh. we have Halloween, we have a new moon, we have a new president. So, well, rather nice. Thank you. That's a beautiful touch. So whatever that means, I do not know. Anyway, uh, here's to you, Mrs. McAleese. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Good luck, good health to enjoy. A million thanks to you and a million thanks right. to everybody, especially oh. Russ Trevor and Belfast tonight who are looking in, the people in Ardoin and Russ Trevor. Can I say a special thank you to them? It means so much to them tonight. Okay, well... As well as everybody else all over Ireland who's watching. I would have to say to you that I got into a considerable amount of trouble for saying on the radio programme things about you when you first, your nomination was first announced. And I take back not one word of it now. That <laughs> I you, you were proved right, as you always are. Right. As I always <laughs> You're so kind. Okay, God bless you. Good God night. God bless and take Good care. Good night. God bless Long. you. Goodbye. Thank you. Here's to you. Now. And you heard the lady say she apologizes most sincerely for uh, not being able to be with us. Um, You'd think he'd have a gag to tell you while I'm doing this. I'm afraid. <laughs> so well you might. So well you might. We're getting a ringing tone there. Can you hear that? Hello? Hello? Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hello? Uh, yes, I'm looking for Anne McCormack, please. Yeah, she's here. Is that you? Hello? This is, that, is Anne. Is that Anne McCormack? Yes, gay. In, I've been watching. What's that road called? Kilt, Kilt, Kilt Road. Kilt Road. Kilt Road. Road in Tallaght. Yeah. Kilt Alon Road in Tallaght. Oh. Uh, who's, oh. there, who's there with you, Anne? My daughter and my son. And how old are they? My daughter is 18 and my son is 11. And, and have you a husband, Anne? Uh, no. No, I see. Okay. So, a 18 Kiltalon Road in Tala. Yeah. And you're all watching the show, of course, were I you? Was. Oh, God, and enjoying it no end up to this moment. Brilliant. Isn't that great? Well, your card got to us, and you had the right answer, and you gave your name and address and telephone number of where you'll be tonight. Would you pick a number between one and ten now? Uh, seven. Isn't it amazing they always go to seven? <laughs> nobody ever picks two, three, or four. And nobody ever picks eight, nine, or ten. That is number oh, seven. Do you see it there? Yeah. Can you see that? Oh, I you can, you see, can it. see me as you're doing this. I can, yeah. Okay, now our Peace Commissioner, Dennis McGivney Nolan, is here in the front row. He will give you ten seconds to answer the, uh, the uh, question. And it must be the answer that I have on the card. Okay. And Anne McCormack, <laughs> if you miss this, <laughs> you should be... Audience, would you please remain quiet? Here's the question, Anne. Yeah. What is the stage name of presidential candidate Rosemary Scallon? Dan. <laughs> you have won a Mercedes Benz 98, your choice of color of car and upholstery, class C, and it's worth Roughly twenty-six thousand pounds. Oh, oh, Jesus! I'm only doing driving lessons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my God! Oh, oh, oh God! Have you say thank you, Patrick Kilty, for picking my card? Thank you, Patrick, and I'll go to all your shows. <laughs> Uh, have you got a car, Anne? No, I haven't. Did you ever have a car? No. And, and, and do you drive at all? Yeah, I've done about 10, 11 lessons at this stage now. 
<laughs> Do you mean you're taking lessons at the moment? Yeah. I say, and how are you doing? I'm doing fairly well. He said I only need another about four or five. <laughs> That, no, that's the driving instructor, not the examiner. Yeah, the driving instructor. And, and, then, and, and why were you taking driving lessons anyway if you've no car? Because I said I might win one. I meant for not. <laughs> Good thinking. <laughs> now, now, do you intend to take this car, Anne, or would you would you rather do a, a deal on a smaller car or something like that? Um, it's very, it's very uh, big for you, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'd have to think about it now. Yeah, yeah, I see. I, I, the two children who are with you, are they your only two children? Yeah. I see, yeah. okay. All right then. Well, uh, I wish you many, many happy... We'll be in touch with you during the week, but you can't take the car until next year anyway, so you have time, because... So it will be a 98 car, you oh, see. Oh, brilliant. Be because, but, well, by then you'll have done your lessons, oh, and I then will. you have to do the test yeah. and all of that, and maybe, please God, you'll, you'll pass the test, but if you get yeah. a very cross examiner, he may fail you. You know the way they are. Oh, God. And that and then <laughs> <laughs> don't don't get depressed already <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, your, your daughters uh, your son and daughter are there are they they are yeah you yeah. only have to come down the stairs out of bed my son <laughs> he was in bed already was he my son yeah why because he usually goes to bed because I'm going down to Mullingar tomorrow I'm going I, I'm going down to my friend in Mullingar tomorrow why does he have to go to bed early because you're going to... Because he has to get up there. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how do I get in so many stupid questions in the course of one show? Quite a mess. Anyway, the car can't because... Because if you took the car now, it would be a 97 car. Oh, yeah. And therefore, it would be worth less on the trade-in. Yeah. So by the time you have your lessons done, your test passed, the car would be waiting there for you. Well, have you any idea what colour you would like, Anne? Um, probably red. Very showy, Anne. Is it? Oh, very showy, yeah, very, very showy. <laughs> and have you thought about the colour of the upholstery? <laughs> I don't no, clearly you haven't. <laughs> right! <laughs> Got you the best to skit with 26 grand worth of a car under your oxen. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. We'll be in touch with you next week. We oh, have to go. Good, okay, thank you. Good night. God bless good you. Night. Good night. And good night from the Late Late Show. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Good night. Well done, Patrick. Well done yourself. Well done. Now, off you go. Started on the Late Late Show. Have you been in one before? Have you? 
Yes, but I got spaceship sick. Malcolm. Did it go too fast? I'm bumpy. Malcolm yep. throws up all the time. <laughs> Delicate tummy. Yes, that's why he's green. I used to be blue. Will you be here the day after tomorrow? We're going to Windsor Castle tomorrow on a trip. But a school trip? It's an alien package tour. Oh. Yeah, to Windsor Castle. Who lives there? The Queen... Queen... Uh, Queen Elizabeth. Ooh. Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. And what does she do? She rules this country. Oh, is that good? Yeah. She's a nice queen. But if I go to be naughty to her, no. She gets really angry. Does she? What does she do if she's angry with you? She smacks you. <laughs> On the bottom. <laughs> now, we are going to have to go back to the cowpat field to see whether or not we can fix the spaceship. We don't actually physically move. Shall, shall I count to three? Well, if it counts to five, that'll give us a chance to go, I, won't I it? Count to five. Really slow. Slow. Close your eyes. Close your eyes.